All right. This is the Wisconsin session. I mean, here's where we, I spent most of my time, not Inner Mongolia. And uh, it's just a really interesting place. So we were constantly trying to figure out what were the stories that we could explore here uh, much more easily than going to Inner Mongolia that would resonate with this whole series. Um, and uh, first, I want to just step back for a moment uh, to say that it's easy to forget that America once appeared to be maybe heading towards some sort of uh, bipartisan consensus about the need to act on climate change. As I mentioned earlier, political will, a very precious commodity. Uh, probably people will forget that uh, in 2000, uh, then candidate George H. Bush, while campaigning in Saginaw, Michigan, said we will require all power plants to meet clean air standards in order to reduce emissions of carbon dioxide within a reasonable period of time. Now, as soon as he got elected, he said, I, didn't, I know I said that, but that's not what I'm going to do. And of course, there was a lot of controversy over these issues uh, during the Bush administration, what influence the oil industry and others had during that period. Still, eight years later, 2008, much closer to our present era, while running for president, uh, Republican Senator John McCain declared in Portland, Oregon that, quote, the facts of global warming demand our urgent attention, especially in Washington. Good stewardship, prudence, and simple common sense demand that we act to meet the challenge and act quickly. Um, of course, today there are many Republicans who question whether the party should be taking any action on the climate front, and uh, particularly among the current crop of uh, presidential candidates, it's really hard to get a question. We do have a potential presidential candidate right here, uh, Governor Scott Walker. So uh, I did take the opportunity to ask him what he thought about climate change. And since he said this, I think I've heard this, it's almost like in different shapes and forms by many different uh, prominent Republicans. He said, I hire people in the State Department of Natural Resources who are trained to be scientists to look at those issues. That's not something I'm trained to go into. So anyhow, uh, uh, Wisconsin is a fascinating kind of stew pot, stew pot uh, to explore all the issues here because uh, we really have, uh, there's a, uh, and we're gonna look at today in this panel where Wisconsin is in the whole effort to reduce carbon emissions as a state, and we're uh, lucky to have with us today Gary Radloff, who's director of the Midwest Energy Policy uh, Analysis Wisconsin Energy Institute, who's written extensively in some really great reports that uh, I saw, uh, that I looked at early on um, in, in my research to talk to us about that. And uh, uh, Charles Franklin, uh, well, first I don't wanna of course, skip over Erin. Erin Heffernan is one of the students who work with me, and she's done a great job, and she was very Wisconsin-oriented. And uh, Alex uh, Krauss, who I, he may have left, but um, I wanted to give him a shout out as well. He uh, worked really hard on some of these issues as well. And the, uh, uh, so she dove into some of the wind issues that resulted in one of our articles. And uh, Charles Franklin uh, was, good enough to stick into his uh, uh, legendary polling uh, efforts, uh, some questions about global warming and carbon taxes uh, for me uh, last year. And he's going to talk a little bit about that. And then uh, Kevin Crosswhite, who is the uh, uh, director of the Wisconsin uh, Office of the Energy and Enterprise Initiative, which is launched by former Congressman uh, Bob Inglis with really one of the centerpieces of their ideas is that climate change science has some serious things to say to everyone, should be looked at, and that the, a, 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 a sound Republican prescription would be a revenue neutral carbon tax in which all the money that's collected and as you tax fossil fuels is then returned to the people in various forms so there's no net increase for government revenue. So uh, I think we have a really good panel. And again, Wisconsin, particularly now, with uh, uh, there are a lot of 
fights and struggles over solar and wind and whether it can move forward here like it's moving forward in other states, it's a, it's a great place to, to look up, up, up close and of course it's where, so it's where Marquette is based. So with that, I wanted to turn it over to Gary. Thank you, Hal. Sneak back here. Well, good morning. It's really a pleasure to be here. Um, I was mentioning to Hal that my first professional career was as a journalist for about a decade. And so I have that tie. Uh, moved on to public policy, and, and 30 years later, I'm still knee-deep in it, which gives you a sense of my age. <laughs> uh, when you talk about carbon, whether it's carbon reduction in Wisconsin, the United States, or China, or, or really globally, uh, you're really talking about the energy marketplace. And, and we have to kind of keep that in mind. And I'll have a little bit of data here that kind of shows how bigger role the, the energy market plays. But I like to say we're in a transition to a new energy economy. And that new energy economy must be based on clean energy solutions. But we have a legacy system that was built around carbon energy uh, over 100 years uh, in the United States or more. And it's treated us well. We have this incredible uh, global economy. We have prosperity uh, for most. And we benefit from that carbon energy system. But that legacy system has to change and go away uh, in order for us to achieve greenhouse gas reductions, which I think are definitely needed. But I think the quote at the bottom kind of shows where we're at here, which is we need to build the new road. Uh, and nobody really gave us any plans for that. So we're carving it as we go. Um, you know, I work with a lot of policymakers, and there was a couple of years here now where people didn't even want to hear the word climate change. I think that is uh, changing. But I think part of the problem is kind of how we message this. And I love this uh, uh, slide here from the World Wildlife Fund because it's so simple and elegant and people will understand it, which is uh, if 97% of the experts told you it was dangerous to go across this bridge, would you drive across it? Well, of course, the analogy is that 97% of the scientists and researchers uh, believe climate change is real, it's man-made, and with all due respect to the 3%, I can't believe they're holding up uh, U.S. and global policy because of that skepticism. I like to say I wear my biases on my sleeve, too, just in case you have a concern about that. Um, you know, I think the, the key here in reinventing our energy system is to this point, which is our primary generation sources of coal, oil, and natural gas, and I, I think we have to keep natural gas in mind, even though it causes some improvement, uh, are really the source of the problem. And you can see rather dramatically here on this slide uh, uh, the scale of, of that problem. And I, I, I have a, a few numbers. I'm not real good at numbers, so I always have to look at my notes. But uh, just if you take, uh, pick the year uh, 2009, uh, carbon dioxide from fossil fuel combustion contributed to 90% of the U.S. emissions, again, in 2009, and that's according to the EPA. Uh, the electric power sector uh, emitted 21,000, uh, 2,100 million tons of carbon dioxide uh, during that period, and that alone was 42% of all U.S. emissions. So we know where the problem is. We need to address it. This is kind of a busy slide, but I really think it's an important slide because it shows us the challenge we face. Um, the, the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory puts this out every year. If you go to their website, I think you can look back 20, 30 years. For the first 20 years, the slide didn't change much. Our generation sources were pretty much all the same, coal and oil. Uh, and then uh, uh, a couple decades ago, nuclear started to become a part of that mix. And only recently did renewables even show up on the chart. Uh, and you can still see the very small part. but. Uh, you also have to realize, maybe it's not depicted all that well in this slide, the scale of this problem. I mean, we are big energy users in the United States. And so for us to change this legacy system, this carbon energy economy, to a clean energy economy is a daunting task. I think it's uh, achievable, but uh, we just have to kind of keep that in mind. It's going to take a lot of work. It's also going to take some public policy. Uh, I kind of like this slide. This came out a couple years ago, uh, uh, I believe, by Citibank. 
one of those banks too big to fail. And uh, they said basically we're in kind of an evolutionary change. And I think that's a good way to think about this. We had the era of, uh, of uh, woody biomass. Uh, you know, people burn things, <laughs> if you will. Uh, and then the era of coal. Uh, and now we're, we're gradually moving from this era of natural gas to, to an era of renewables. But the dates that they put out there, I think, are a little too far away. I think we need to make this uh, evolutionary change speed up a little bit, if you will. And uh, uh, so we'll see kind of how that goes. So specifically here to Wisconsin, uh, right now we have uh, what's called a 10% renewable portfolio standard, which is a 10% mandate that our regulated utilities provide uh, at least 10% of their energy generation from renewable sources. A couple of things to notice on this in terms of Wisconsin achieving this, and we did actually achieve it in the last year. The mandate was uh, actually a year out. Uh, uh, they, they achieved it a year early. Uh, which uh, I, I congratulate the utilities on that. Um, but you'll see we got an awful lot of it from out of state. Uh, the, good, the good folks of Iowa have a lot of abundant wind that I think people purchased from uh, in power purchase agreements. Um, and the other thing that I think is probably worth noting on here, I have trouble sort of reading the, the slide from where I'm standing, but look at the amount of solar generation in, the, in Wisconsin. It's less than 1%. Now, I think you've probably heard about all the hoopla about fixed charges and utility rates. Uh, it's been kind of a hot item here in Madison and Milwaukee in the last uh, 48 hours even, as there were public hearings at the Public Service Commission. Um, I kind of call what's going on in the, in the Wisconsin utility sector as a, a solution in search of a problem. Wisconsin's PV is the threat to utilities, and it's less than 1% of our generation. So. Obviously, what they're concerned about, though, is the future and the transition as a, a solar PV comes down in price, that it'll uh, get more and more into the marketplace and erode uh, some of their revenue base. So where do we stand uh, compared to our, our fellow states? Again, it's kind of hard to see with this slide because it's all subtle greens, but we're actually below uh, the average now, uh, even with our 10% mandate. Uh, so I think Wisconsin has a lot of work ahead of it. Um, uh, we are a coal state. I believe still 50% of our energy is from coal, uh, which, again, as you saw in the earlier slide, is the highest uh, greenhouse gas emission carbon source. And this is the one that gets people's attention. Uh, 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 there was a story in yesterday's newspaper by the Center for Investigative Journalism where they used this slide and... and uh, uh, they talked to me about this, which is Wisconsin has completely gone the opposite way of the U.S. trend. The U.S. trend for solar PV is sort of going off the charts. And Wisconsin, just in the last three to four years, has taken this incredible dive. And it's all about public policy. <laughs> the access uh, to, to uh, uh, people to provide and sell solar is pretty much blocked in this state. Uh, it's centered around something called the third party uh, business rule, which basically says if you, uh, uh, you know, generate energy and your company is put installing these systems, you have to be a utility. And if you've ever looked at the statutory definition of a utility, uh, if you're a business person, you probably don't want that definition. And just one brief aside is in California, the majority of installations have come from these third party leasing, which allow uh, someone, a uh, company to come in like uh, Solar City um, and uh, install it with no money up front. That's, so even if you didn't have a lot of savings, you could try to do that. Right, exactly. A good point to make. There really are now two ways the marketplace allows you to get into putting solar on, on your home or your small business. One is a lease type arrangement, and the other is they'll actually loan you the money. So it really has become quite easy in many states to install solar. And my question is, why not? I mean, every one of us in this room is an energy user. What would be so wrong if we were also energy producers? Think about that. So wind. Um, the Midwest is the wind powerhouse, if you will. It's amazing. Uh, the state of Iowa gets almost 30% of their energy now from, from wind. But once again, Wisconsin has 
sort of failed in this marketplace, and it's really frustrating. Again, I know, apologize, it's kind of hard to read these colored nuances on these slides, but that little, little, little thin line on the top of this slide is Wisconsin. We're dead last in the Midwest for wind generation as well. And I think we have to ask our utilities, why is that? And you hear some critics say, well, renewable energy is too expensive. We really can't integrate it into our system. We have all this cheap natural gas and coal. Well, there are at least 15 independently done studies, which I can cite if you wish, that have shown that the 11 states with the most wind generation in their states have seen their electrical rates go down over the last five years. The other 39 states their prices have gone up on average 7%. So don't tell me wind energy is not a cheap option, at least for some states. I can't say that it is for all. So I want to finish on an optimistic note. I said I'd keep this short, but uh, I don't want it all to be negative. And that is, I think we can change our energy marketplace if we have the political will to do it, and that's a big if. Um, I think there are some core concepts that we have to think about. One is we un need to unlock the marketplace to allow for experimentation. If we're going to have an 80% reduction in greenhouse gases by 2050, which is the president's stated goal, I'm not sure we have the technology today to do that. But I think we can get there. So we need to experiment. We need innovation. Second slide or second point, spur innovation. We need a continuous cycle of innovation. I think we need to work with our utilities to protect them from a, a failure, if you will, in some of this innovation. And I don't think that's a problem at all. But we need to allow them to innovate. We need to encourage competition, and that gets to that point I made about third parties. We need to reward some really key things. Energy efficiency, what some people call megawatts, are the cheapest watts there are. <laughs> energy we don't use, don't have to produce. And we need to really reward clean energy technologies in order to green, reduce free greenhouse gases. And there's something out there called performance-based rates, which I won't go into detail on now, but if you're interested, I could possibly talk about later, which basically would reward the utilities for achieving energy efficiency goals and renewable energy goals, i.e., they can make money off this, and they will. Um, Finally, I, we do need to allow for greater R&D. I don't have a problem if we were to change the rules, change the laws in Wisconsin and other states to allow utility companies to invest more in R&D and have it be off the rate uh, structure if they're a regulated utility. And the one that I just cannot believe at all, and I take the federal government, the state government, and anybody who will listen to task, is we need to plan for change. We have tremendous infrastructure needs we need to make in this country in order to achieve a clean energy technology and to be blunt, I see no plan. And finally, um, I think this is an important concept that we've lost over the last 40 years, uh, particularly with what are, are called our regulated monopoly utilities that exist in uh, over 30 states, uh, is they were founded as public utilities. If you go back and look at the legal analysis, and I think the citation at the bottom of the slide by Dr. Boyd, uh, there's a great paper out there that he wrote on this topic. Is we've now, over the last 30 years, lost this concept of the public utility, and we need to bring it back quickly <laughs> and remind them that they are public utilities, even if they're an investor-owned utility. So kind of think about that one, chew on that. And I do, yep, uh, that's it. I thank you for your time, and we'll, we have a great panel here. We'll talk some more about this. We're going to let Erin talk briefly now just about some of her experiences exploring some of these issues in Wisconsin that took her to a little town called uh, Farce. OK. Um, am I mic'd up? Can you hear me? All right. So um, I'll just first start by you know explaining how I got on the fellowship. I met Hal because he started auditing my Chinese politics class. And he was, he and Lillian Thomas um, were actually coming into the, our student newspaper. And I just have to say that getting an email from either of them or, or just having them say something about a story I wrote was a real testament to this uh, fellowship. So I decided I needed to worm my way on <laughs> onto the fellowship, and I'm really glad that I did. Um, so, you know, these stories sometimes are, I, 
how what was looking for a human face to the Wisconsin you know centric story and I feel like sometimes these stories are hard to connect to because there are such big issues and there are so many you know moving parts so um, I kind of started focusing on these very vocal very emotional debates about wind farms that were being built in Wisconsin um, and one of the, the places that had been written about the most, and but no one had actually gone there, <laughs> was this little town of Forest, Wisconsin. It's a town of 600 people in St. Croix County, um, about a mile, about um, an hour and a half from Minnesota, Minnesota so way up north, um, and sort of out by itself, this agricultural community. And um, at least when we wrote this, I think it was the only wind farm sort of proposal that was, you know, new wind farm proposal to, that was planning to be built in Wisconsin. Um, so it was sort of, and it sort of became a symbol of the stalled effort um, to get more wind to come to Wisconsin. Um, so I went there and, um, and I, I spoke with uh, both a wind advocate there and this very vocal group, the Forest Voice, that was against the wind farm. And what they had managed to do there was they recalled their entire town board um, who were in favor of the wind farm. And they elected in people who were against the wind farm. Um, then there was legal battle after legal battle. The wind, the wind company made it so that they were um, under the state board rather than the local board. And then the, the local town board decided to sue the wind company. And so now they're in a legal lawsuit that they, you know, should have to go through the local town board. So, you know, two years later, they still haven't broken ground on the wind farm. And um, Wisconsin still hasn't had another wind farm come in that time, at least. Um, so, you know, it was kind of looking at and talking, and these people, you talk to them, they, they say that the, the argument has truly torn the, the town apart. And it's just apparent when you go there. Um, they say, you know, neighbors who had been friends their entire lives aren't talking to each other. I mean, this is a tiny place. There's one bar, um, no stoplights. <laughs> uh, everyone knows everyone. And, but you drive down the streets, and there's every other, about every other door has this no turbine sign this, that they, they've been spreading out. Um, <laughs> so you can just see it. You can just see the division. And then how, you know, took that story and, and connected it to the larger division over wind and, and how these people are, you know, being taken up by, you know, legislative members in Wisconsin and nationally to block wind. And it's a lot of, you know, I guess big, a lot of questions people have is why are they so against wind? Um, so there you have to say you spent a night, you spent a night in a haunted, you know, a house <laughs> that, uh, where they're, been huge complaints about how wind farms were disrupting their health. So yeah. it didn't quite turn into a total story, but you did spend. Yeah, time. I'll talk about that. Yeah, so one of the biggest complaints that these people have is that wind turbines make you sick. Um, and there's much debate over, over this uh, where in areas that a lot of wind turbines are going in. Um, they say that sleep deprivation, um, you know, headaches, all these other things. So one of the most vocal people who are complaining about this in Wisconsin, um, who's living on, on a, a, uh, a wind farm, Gary, Jerry Meyer, um, we wanted to see if I felt anything <laughs> when I went, um, if I felt any health effects, because a lot of these people were complaining that you could feel it within hours. So I went and I spent the night. I was kind of the like, lab rat, I guess, <laughs> um, to see if I felt anything, and I didn't. But we never actually turn it into a full story because it's hard. It's such a, a tricky topic, you know. If you're actually, if you know, I didn't feel anything. Will everybody not feel anything? And it's we just decided to go in a different direction. But it was a very interesting experience to sort of um, talk to these people. And and we also we went to the uh, largest uh, dairy farm in Wisconsin when we, we were kind of looking into biogas for a while. And um, so we went on a lot of different sort of reporting adventures, which think were just totally invaluable to me. So, um, yes, yeah, so I'm really appreciative for this opportunity. Yeah. Really appreciated her help, and she was also at the Seattle Times this mm -hmm. summer. 
So I guess now we're going to turn to the political side of the equation, because political will, you've heard those <laughs> words come up quite a bit. And so we were curious. So we turned to Charles Franklin, who's nationally recognized govern government scholar and pollster, and has become director of the Marquette Law School poll since its inception in 2012. And he's been a full-time faculty member since 2013. Yes. Good to be here. Thank you. Um, I'd also just say at the beginning that uh, as sort of a uh, uh, journalism groupie, it's been nice to be around the O'Brien Fellows. And uh, we haven't had coffee every day, but every in encounter has been enjoyable, not just with Hal, but with the other fellows and the new fellows this year. Um, but Hal's project was particularly apt because uh, a professor in, in the Diedrich School, um, Bob Griffin, and I have been uh, collaborating a little bit on climate change questions. In 2012, we were able to include items on the, the law school poll uh, that asked about global warming and um, um, the evidence for it and whether it was scientifically based. And we particularly timed that because it was at the end of an unusually hot summer. So in the spring last year, after an unusually cold winter, we thought it was a good opportunity to repeat that question because of the issue of how people confuse climate change with short-term weather events and how much difference would we see there. Um, but through either wonderful serendipity or uh, subtle planning on Hal's part, uh, the opportunity to include those items with Bob also arose just at the moment that Hal was interested in looking at carbon tax opinions. So we were able to combine the two in one survey, and uh, this is one of the nice things about having the poll is the ability to work with colleagues in other colleges and other departments to uh, address some of these things. Um, so what we asked here in Wisconsin, I'm going to talk about just two items. And unlike people that actually have proposed solutions to problems, all I can talk about are the political uh, divisions and coalitions that any kind of approach to these issues face. So that's what we'll talk about here. And, and the first thing is in our questions about do you believe uh, the, cli the Earth's climate is warming or not, we see a very large here in Wisconsin uh, perception that it is. 63% believe warming is taking place. 31% say it's not. And that's across those two surveys, both 2012 and 2013, or 2014. Um, so that's you know, it, more or less in line with national opinion polls. We then tried to craft a question about a carbon tax. And this is a little tricky because, with all due respect, most people don't wake up every morning thinking, hmm, how could we tax carbon in an efficient way? Um, so the way we presented it to people was, um, would you favor or oppose a tax on carbon to reduce emissions if the costs of that tax were offset by reductions in other taxes so there was no net change in total taxes. Uh, so that was the way we tried to inform voters of what we meant by a, uh, a carbon tax. And on that item, support was at 51% for that kind of tax, 38% opposed. So down a bit on support compared to belief in warming, so the solution not quite as well supported, and, a, and up from 31 to 38% opposition but still a fairly sizable uh, majority, or at least plurality, 51 against 38, uh, would see a revenue neutral carbon tax as something we could do. Um, so that was the first cut at the data. What I want to really mention today are a couple of things. When Hal and I first talked about it, one of the questions was whether there were generational differences here that would stand out, and especially would they show a stand out within parties? Would we see uh, different generations within the two parties having different views? What we find is some evidence that there are some generational differences on the question of warming, 
But I didn't find any generational differences that were statistically reliable on the carbon tax solution. So the, the finding is that younger voters within the Republican Party and within the Democratic Party are more likely to say global warming is real, and older voters in both parties that it's not, but there's also a partisan difference with Republicans considerably more skeptical on average than Democrats are. So that difference, that age effect, that generational difference, if you will, shows up on the question of warming, did not show up on the solution, though, where there was no age effect at all. So let's talk about where there are clear differences, and the first will hardly surprise anyone in polarized Wisconsin that there are huge partisan differences here. There are also huge ideological differences. Liberals and Democrats are much more willing to believe in warming and much more willing to support a carbon tax. Republicans and conservatives much more unwilling to support a tax and uh, less likely to, to agree that warming is taking place. So in the question of sort of how do you marshal a political coalition on this, that represents exactly the dilemma. Two polarized parties that can't find overlapping coalitions that might allow a deal to be made are going to face some difficulty with this. We looked at a couple of other things, though, uh, socioeconomic elements. Um, in particular, income and education. What we found was that the higher someone's years of schooling from high school or uh, only elementary school up to a postgraduate degree, the more education people had, the more they accepted the notion that climate change was real, that the climate is warming. But interestingly, on that question of warming, there was no effect whatsoever of income. Rich or poor didn't make any difference to whether you accepted the idea that warming was taking place. But when we move to the uh, carbon tax question, again, education played a role making people more willing to accept a revenue neutral carbon tax. But here, income was noticeably negative. So the higher your income, the less willing you were, were to accept the carbon tax, even though it was presented as revenue neutral. Now, we didn't probe that enough to know if that's because um, higher income people think that even if it's net revenue neutral, in, you know, they will end up paying more for it, or whether it's simply a greater skepticism of any kind of tax-based solution among higher incomes. But notice the contradiction here because, of course, here at a university, it's good news that the more education you get, the more money you make. We like that. It's a good reason to go to college. Um, but it means that the education effect is driving up support, but higher income is driving down support. So there's a bit of a divide between those two groups which in many ways are an overlapping group. One element of their status higher education, greater support, but another element, higher income, less support for the carbon tax. So I, I will close with this notion of the political coalitions that are out there, a sharp partisan and ideological divide, which must find, in order to solve that problem, some overlapping groups from both sides that would like to accept action. Now, maybe it's a carbon tax, maybe it's something else. Um, and then finally, on the education and income side, you have a social status uh, effect that uh, pushes in opposite directions on the solution. Well, that's, thank you so much, Charles. That was really interesting, and that's a lot more in depth than I've heard. Uh, so, so it was really interesting, and it, it, it's a great way to segue into uh, Kevin Crosswhite, who uh, he was kind enough to let me badger him with interviews and everything. He was featured in one of our stories for just all the reasons we've been talking about. Is it possible that we could reach a bipartisan consensus? Or is it, is it even possible that there are maybe generational changes within the Republican Party that will emerge as, as people uh, of a younger generation uh, 
uh, take more power in the party? I don't know the answers to these questions, but Kevin is really uh, uh, devoting his time and effort to uh, focusing on these issues, and he has some really fascinating stuff to talk to us about. So. Well, I'd first like to thank Marquette and the O'Brien Fellowship for supporting journalists like him. Uh, I, you know, I don't speak alone when uh, so we all enjoyed his work. He's done some fantastic things with his, uh, his series. So with the Energy and Enterprise Initiative, we're a group of conservatives that believe climate change is an issue and we should do something about it. And I'm not kidding, we're real. Um, we are headed by uh, former Congressman Bob Inglis, who was in Congress for 12 years. And then uh, the country decided to have a tea party and not invite him. Uh, but he's a very conservative guy. He uh, had a 97% rating with the American Conservative Union, 100% Christian <laughs> Coalition, and I want to say single digits, and he still doesn't understand why not a zero with the AFL-CIO and a few other uh, more liberal groups. But uh, we're a very conservative group, and we think that the, the scientific consensus around climate change uh, brings us to believe that we should look at this as an issue that we should uh, present a solution for. Uh, so we, we look at the climate change a little bit differently than many do, though. Uh, we look at climate change as an economic issue with environmental effects. Um, and because of that, we are, our solutions definitely reflect that kind of idea. And uh, we think a lot of the, the issues that uh, Professor Franklin here has showed that we have with Republicans and conservatives on climate change is because a lot of the proposed solutions kind of take the opposite direction. Um, with Waxman Markey or Cap and Trade, where you uh, was proposed in the a few years ago, uh, cap emissions and then trade allocations, um, it would have decimated our uh, economy. Manufacturing would have been hurt pretty substantially um, just because uh, international competitiveness would be harmed quite a bit. Uh, so we take a little bit of a different direction. Um, and we look at it, and what does a conservative uh, perspective look like on climate change? Well, first off, it allows price signals to compete. It allows price signals to dictate fuel sources and allows the free market and free enterprise to, to advance forward. Um, secondly, it's revenue neutral. Uh, we don't want to grow government anymore, and that's part of the problem with um, cap and trade. It, it grows government substantially. And then thirdly, it, it ensures that competitiveness uh, internationally um, that we think we can uh, achieve through a border adjustments or different tariffs. So with price signals, how do you allow price signals to, to work? You know, well, first off, you have to stop the government from uh, keep their hands off the scales for different technologies and fuel sources. So that means getting rid of all subsidies for um, various technologies and fuel sources. So uh, renewable energy, but also coal and uh, oil and any uh, across the board, getting rid of subsidies. But that also means getting rid of possibly the biggest subsidy we have now, which is the ability to pollute into the air at no cost. Um, we can debate and discuss what the social cost of carbon is, but I think we can certainly say with a very positive degree of confidence that uh, it's certainly not zero. There is a cost of polluting, and carbon emissions certainly has a cost uh, not only to society but to our economy. And what is that risk? And as we've seen, industry has started to price this as well. Insurance and Wall Street is really pricing uh, climate. Uh, carbon uh, is a risk to the climate and how it can affect our economy. So you do that by removing subsidies uh, across the board and then adding a price to, to carbon, um, which I think we're at $47 is the inter-agency inter, uh, um, price that we've, we've likely looked at. Uh, so price carbon, remove all subsidies, and allow uh, free enterprise to actually dictate uh, fuel sources. Um, solar, wind, or whatever have you uh, can actually compete and, and foster new innovation, and we can grow the economy simply by allowing free enterprise to take charge. With revenue neutrality, uh, that's something that we, uh, points that we, we, we would like to take action on climate change, carbon tax is the way we think we can do it. It's kind of a, as a negative externality that we have with, with uh, carbon emissions, it's through a carbon tax. But with that said, there's a way we should do it. And the two things that we're uh, absolutely necessary that we would like, and it is revenue neutrality and a border adjustment. With revenue neutrality, we're, we're not too specific on what we'd like to cut in taxes. Um, I know there's some regressivity issues that you can combat with a payroll tax cut or a corporate tax rate um, cut. But either way, a dollar for dollar cut in taxes uh, actually would grow the economy. Uh, taxes are harmful to the economy in any way, but some are worse than others. And I think climate change is happening. So I definitely want less carbon emissions, but someone who's more skeptical, some of my fellow conservatives, unfortunately, uh, might be a little more skeptical. Um, may possibly want less carbon emissions because uh, they're not sure climate change is happening. 
but we probably or possibly or definitely want less carbon emissions, but we absolutely want more income. We absolutely want more economic growth and prosperity. So by taking a tax off of income or businesses or um, various other product productive taxes and putting it onto um, carbon emissions, you can actually create a more pro-growth tax structure while reducing the risks of climate change by allowing free enterprise to, to take hold. Uh, so it's Art, Art Laffer, um, chief economist for Ronald Reagan, uh, famous for the Laffer curve, actually helped devise this with us. Um, and he's, he's agnostic on climate change. Uh, he's an economist, not a climatologist. He's not sure whether climate change is happening or not. But he does know that taxes on income is astoundingly stupid. So by simply moving the taxes off income onto something we may want less of, we can actually grow the economy regardless of climate change while combating the risks at the exact same time. Now, one of the, the, the final issue that we have on this is ensuring international competitiveness. And, and conservatives uh, very often make this point, and rightfully so. Why should the United States take action when there are countries like China that are polluting much more and, and being much more harmful to the climate than we are? Um, and if we have to decide between hurting the economy and, and, and manufacturing in the United States, it doesn't make too much sense. So uh, we can combat that by possibly even strong arming some other countries into uh, pricing carbon in their own countries uh, with a border adjustment or adding a tariff uh, on imported goods. So we, whatever goods we import into the United States, we add a tariff for however much uh, carbon was polluted by uh, creating that, and then when exporting, take that tax off. So countries like China, when they are exporting into the United States, they would be paying a tariff. Rather than paying the tariff to us, they can actually just price carbon in their own Economy, and then they could just be paying it to Beijing. So rather than paying the United States, they can pay themselves on it. So we think by actually adding a border adjustment, a tariff, we would, the, the whole world would kind of follow suit and price carbon in their own economies so they don't have to pay the tariffs into the United States. And then it also protects um, the American economy and manufacturing here. Uh, and that's, we call it a tax swap. And that's essentially what it is, swapping taxes off of income onto carbon and uh, Ensure using a border adjustment to ensure international competitiveness. Um, and that's the way that we think conservatives should be able to rally behind on this and, and fight against climate. And we don't, conservatives don't have to choose between addressing climate change or hurting the economy or keeping the economy strong. Now we think we can do both with this policy. Um, but one of the other things that I'd like to touch on, I know uh, this was talked about a little bit earlier with uh, the solar in, in Wisconsin. Um, with the rate cases and changes to uh, feed-in tariffs. Um, this is something conservatives should really, really be upset about with these rate cases. If, you're, if you support competition and free enterprise and, and competitive markets, um, the rate cases that have been proposed currently are pretty detrimental and fairly draconian, frankly. Um, solar, whatever costs that are incurred by solar or wind or whoever's paying back to the grid um, should be paid by whoever is, is bearing those costs. And, Everyone pretty much agrees with that across the board. But there hasn't even been a study in Wisconsin to show what those costs are. And the utilities are suggesting that these wildly increased fees, regardless of the fact that there's nothing behind them, they're completely abstract figures. So the utilities at this point are, uh, as was suggested early, are, earlier, are um, hedging against growth. And, and as a conservative who would like to see competition in this, uh, it can be pretty detrimental. Um, so it's the, the two ways I think Wisconsin can certainly move forward here is with ensuring competitive energy markets and just allowing for fair play across the board with utilities and self-generating electricity and uh, revenue neutral uh, tax swap with a border adjustment. That's great. Um, Kevin and uh, Bob Inglis were both very uh, generous with their time. And uh, just one small footnote is that uh, at some point in the year, I went to Washington, D.C., and I talked to a real uh, veteran uh, staffer in Congress on these issues. And he said that the thinking had changed dramatically among those who are still hopeful that there could be some action in Congress, and that really the proposals that uh, Kevin have outlined would be the basis for any new deal in Congress to move ahead. And there's Republicans who quietly embrace this idea, not publicly, because it's not very politically correct, uh, active, and, and, and they've talked about it. And of course, part of the deal is that they would have to back off on the 
EPA and some of the other stuff. But if anything happens, and that's of course a big if, it probably now would look a lot more like what uh, Kevin has just talked about. So I, I know we should probably ask for questions, but uh, we really appreciate everyone being here. Sure, John. I was happy to hear that there's a conservative position on the science of climate change. Uh, as a solution, it did feel a little bit like you guys are trying to leverage the issue to get some other sorts of political changes. So if, if you knew you couldn't get that other, those other kind of changes in taxes and so forth, would you, continue, would you still have a position on climate change that respected the scientific data? Sure. Do you have a plan B? Yeah, regardless, uh, we, we certainly think climate change is happening and humans are impacting it. Um, we think this is the best policy to, to address it. Um, if it doesn't happen, I mean, we're, we're, we're a C3, so we work kind of in abstracts, not specifically on legislation. So we, we don't, haven't thought too much of what, what a different bill would look like. Um, but we think with those three points, we can allow uh, Americans to not have to choose between growing the economy and addressing climate change and utilizing conservative free principles of property rights and competitive markets. Um, so I don't have too much of an answer for you on that one for what a different bill would look like. Uh, but that's, we think we've put together a, a pretty solid uh, policy that can be supported by conservatives. And where we are now is with meshed in such girdlock that, and maybe there's some point that will change, is if there was any hope of a deal there would have to be compromise on both sides. And what I'm picking up is a lot of Democrats are very interested in this approach as well. Sure. So it's not as contradictory as, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm curious about, um, you referenced the issue of Wisconsin um, uh, having this uh, barrier from third party, um, it prevents us from having better solar. Could you just talk more about that and why we might have that in Wisconsin versus California, which I understand doesn't have that restriction? <clears throat> right, uh, good question. There's basically, uh, I have the numbers in my notes, but I'm just gonna kind of generalize. I think about a third of, of the states now uh, allow for, for third party companies to get into the marketplace uh, and sell solar. Uh, and Wisconsin, because we uh, have uh, uh, investor-owned utilities, uh, regulated monopolies, uh, what I like to call government-sanctioned monopolies, they hate <laughs> that term, um, is, uh, you know, they basically, because the way the laws are written, their, their market share is protected. And so for anybody to come into that market, uh, in essence, is a threat to their guaranteed uh, 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 monopoly and uh, so it would take action by the legislature to change the, the, the statutes and there was a bill last session uh, uh, to do that and uh, uh, I know uh, uh, a number of uh, NGOs are out there pushing that legislation and hopefully it'll start to get a little more debate in this state uh, because I, again I think it's an issue that would really unify conservatives and liberals or Republicans and Democrats and I spent a, a good chunk of my career uh, dealing with both parties, in fact, working for both parties at one point, um, that I think it is something that they would actually be open to because they are a little astounded, like really? Businesses can't get into the marketplace at all? And that's pretty much true. Uh, uh, again, you, it, it, there are sort of little ways around it, but I won't get into those subtleties. Uh, uh, but basically, fairly quickly, you would be considered a utility if you were installing let's just say more than 10 uh, uh, solar panels uh, for, for businesses or, or individuals. And so it will take a statutory change in order to allow those third parties to come into Wisconsin. Uh, as Hal mentioned, in California, it's just completely changed the marketplace. It's extremely competitive. And uh, uh, you know, I actually think it would be really good for the state economy to do that. And, you know, the thing that we could do, you know, I always kind of reach out to the utilities and say, okay, come on, please work with me here. Um, you know, is I think we can create new marketplaces uh, for clean energy technology 
let the utilities compete. Let them form third, you know, their own third party companies or partnerships with existing third party companies and uh, compete directly with these, you know, so called out of state companies, if you will, eventually be in state uh, uh, in that marketplace as well. But uh, it would definitely take statutory change to do that. In, in Washington state, we, we also don't allow third party leasing, but one of the biggest some of the biggest opponents, we have a homegrown solar industry, and they're worried that the big boys are going to come in with all this leasing and that they can offer a better option just by um, having financing for the people who don't have the money and that the returns aren't as good on the leasing and that, that they should, you know, that, that it would just sort of be the end of the homegrown. That's one of the arguments. And so there's been incredible lobbying on these issues. Um, and uh, because very much so, the solar leasing folks say, "Look, if, let us all compete, you know." And 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 they want to have the rules changed in Washington. So we're going to be seeing how they're changed very soon. But when I came home to Washington to write that story, I found that that story could be written from Washington, and and, that, and my editors like that. They said, "Just Dateline one from Washington." <laughs> I have a question more from an economic standpoint. Um, and this is what a college student knows from basic economic classes. So um, in terms of being able to introduce all these third party companies to compete in the Wisconsin market for solar, wouldn't we have to subsidize, though, the utilities? In, ter in terms of their losing uh, market share? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, the you know, the, the one thing I have to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shift it just a tiny bit, but I'll try to get back to your initial question about this debate around the fixed charges and what the utilities are now asking for, is there's a, there is a legitimate dimension to their request, which is they have high fixed costs. I mean, those, you know, the, the wires, the, the equipment that generates it, their, their staff, the people that go fix things, whatever. Utilities have high fixed costs. But traditionally, they recover them through the traditional rate process. So now they've come in asking to raise the fixed cost. Um, and I think it's, uh, this is probably a 20 minute answer, so I won't give it to you. I think it was a little bit of a political hedge because they thought saw an opportunity to do it and it protects them for a period of time. Uh, so to your point though, there are lots of other ways to help utilities pay for their fixed costs. One is the traditional rate structure. They come in every couple of years to the Public Service Commission and ask for a rate increase public, it's debated, you can challenge it, uh, whatever. But also, what we've proposed uh, at the Wisconsin Energy Institute is some rethinking of our utility, and I have a paper uh, that we wrote that's online, self-serving plug here, I can maybe show it to you later. Uh, but uh, we're proposing completely reinventing the distribution system and allowing for uh, a competition within just that market. Not the, they, the utilities can still sell bulk power and do all the things they do, but on the distribution level, it's kind of more the local level to kind of keep it simple. You could make that a competitive marketplace. And again, the utilities can compete in this. What this would allow actually to occur for utilities is it would grow what's called the value pie. For economists, you can understand. Let's create more wealth with new opportunities of uh, PV panels, microgrids, energy storage, uh, electric vehicle plug-in. There's all kinds of ways the utilities can make money other than selling you dirty coal. <laughs> so, but you, you do have to reinvent that marketplace. And that would be kind of both a, a, a statutory change and an economic mindset change, if you will. But it's very achievable. Uh, this is not just a bunch of crazy, uh, University researchers, the state of New York is doing it as we speak. In the next six to 18 months, New York will completely reinvent its energy system. Um, just, and just piggybacking a little bit on that question, um, from a real micro standpoint, from my own personal experience, when I wanted to buy a solar powered um, water heater, several years ago, the cost, my question is, is the cost of production on the solar power on those types of appliances and things 
reasonable? Is it coming down? Is it getting better? Because the, the cost of actually buying a water heater solar power was, the, the return on that was going to take many years. It was not at all even competitive, even close. I would be willing to pay more for it, but it, not that much more. Well, there, it was well, there so couple, there out of whack. things on that. One is, I don't think on the water heaters, it, the prices have come down as much as the photovoltaics. But the second thing is, you're not getting any benefit for saying, you know what, you're saving carbon emissions. And so therefore, like in some states, like they're saying, like if you do that, you're going to get this type of credit or this type of this or that, because we understand you're going to be cutting down on some of your carbon emissions. With no price on carbon, the payback looks pretty bleak if you start to get credit for that, depending what price you put on carbon the economics would, would look better. So I think those are all part of the puzzle, um, uh, you know, having that recognition, um, and then that's an important thing. And to piggyback on what Hal is saying is, the price of, uh, of photovoltaic, uh, you know, the solar panels on your house basically, has gone down 80% in, in like four or five years because of market competition. I mean, you get more uh, deployment, price goes down. And the second thing that can really, the second thing that really brings down prices is, is uh, something uh, that I'm doing some work on in the state here is, is, is called the Energy Technology Innovation System. And basically, if you cur encourage entrepreneurial and R investment and R and D in an area, which I think with clean technology is ripe for, uh, it can bring the cost down quickly. So I think that there's both market forces and uh, innovation forces that can bring prices down, not just for uh, solar water heaters or solar PV, but for other technologies as well. So uh, there's a rule you're supposed to let six people go between your two questions. I don't know if I quite made the six, but uh, Charles, I wanted to ask you uh, to reflect again. I think you talked about the difference, the age difference, mm -hmm. but could you reflect on that in the context of what we're hearing? And I guess I'm looking sure. for, in the future, will there be a different uh, political will to maybe right. make some of these changes? Well, I, I think that where we saw a sharp age difference, or at least a statistically meaningful age difference, um, was in the acceptance of the notion that warming is real and that it's actually taking place. Uh, that's an area where older people, and especially older Republicans, are much less willing to accept that notion. Younger Republicans much more willing um, Democrats are more flat and independents a little more willing as they get uh, younger uh, to accept it. Um, but the issue of the solutions is where we found no differences at all. And so in a way that's sort of interesting that um, agreement about a problem has this generational difference, but a complex answer to the question, how do we fix this, uh, maybe not so surprisingly, sort of runs across the age spectrum and it's driven more by ideology, partisanship, and so on. So uh, I, to put it a different way, the positive side of that is that it's a slightly weaker set of coalitions on the solution side, on, on the carbon tax side, whereas the structure is a little stronger on the acceptance of warming as an issue. So in that sense, maybe the policy solutions could be a little more malleable. And, and Hal's comment about seeing Democrats considering this as a viable solution and one they could get behind if it also addresses the economic concerns that are front and center with conservatives on the tax side, well, at least traditionally of that and a little bit of pork barrel spending were <laughs> solutions made. And I was just wondering, because since we have to wrap it up, we could let Kevin have the last word, because Kevin goes around to college campuses extensively. He talks with people, some of whom might talk to me and some of whom might not. Uh, but, but he, this isn't scientific polling, I know, but I just think he should have the last word on that. Yeah, the, very anecdotally, uh, we've been speaking with college Republicans and young conservatives across the state for a while now. Uh, one of them's right over here. Uh, one of your Marquette College Republicans here. Uh, and younger conservatives get it. They, they see issues with possible solutions, um, but they think climate change is certainly something we should address. And as younger conservatives, 
uh, look at our last two presidential elections, see issues with uh, how we're performing in the ballot box. And this is something where conservatives can come across the aisle and say, we have a solution for you here. We're not, we're not anti-science, we have ideas, and this is something that we can actually work with you on. And this is something where we can move uh, the conservative movement forward and, and improve the economy and combat the issues. So with younger conservatives, when it's laid out and explained and made a discussion, it, it, they're much more open to the discussion. But uh, I think you certainly see with um, some older conservatives, uh, there's quite a bit of uh, a notion that it's just not happening and there's no point in discussing it. Um, but I, I think there's certainly hope for the future, to put it that way, with conservatives. Thanks, everybody, for coming in.